personally, I like things to be a little bit more tailored to what I am interested in. Uh, so I tend to try to find materials that are exactly uh, around topics I love. So that tends to be hard then to use a course because they tend to be around pretty generic, dry topics. Um, that said, I think when you are absolutely a beginner in a language, probably a little bit of doing a course or a Duolingo or something like that probably will be necessary just because there's not going to be, an, you're not going to know enough vocabulary or structures yet to really understand authentic content in the very, very beginning. So it's a mix usually, uh, but definitely as I get more advanced, I, I like to just use only what we call authentic content. So real, you know, movies and TV shows, real blogs, real uh, books. Day one, not usually. Uh, that's something I've changed my mind on over the years. Uh, when I first studied linguistics in college, university, um, there was definitely an emphasis on focusing on input first and then waiting until you've had a lot of input to start output, speaking and writing. I've changed my mind on that over the years. I do think it's really easy to put off speaking for a long, long time out of fear, especially for somebody like me who is who struggles with perfectionism. I do think you should start speaking and communicating long before you quote unquote feel ready. Uh, so not day one per se, but definitely within the first few months of a language, yes. Uh, false dichotomy. <laughs> I do a bit of both. Definitely. Uh, I love paper books. I mean, I, I love the feel of them in your hands and being able to underline words and sentences. However, uh, I think when it comes to learning the language, digital materials can be a lot more efficient because you can just tap on a word, for example, to look it up and then save it and make flashcards out of it. So I, I try to get a mix. Uh, in context, I, I think the worst thing you can do of learning a language is to learn individual words, you know, one side of a flashcard with the word and then the other side with just the definition. I think that is an awful, boring, inefficient way to do it. So I do think flashcards can be helpful, but make sure that the content on those flashcards come from content that you've actually listened to or read and then make your own flashcards. I think that's a huge advantage. Uh, yes and no. I, I think, uh, there's a lot of debate about this. A lot of people think that you have to consciously study grammar to be able to use grammar correctly. And that is rubbish. We actually, just like a child, you get lots and lots of exposure and you intuitively figure out at a subconscious level how grammar works. And there's a great quote by Barry Farber, which is, you do not have to know grammar to obey grammar. So yes, we definitely want to be able to produce accurate sentences and, and structures, but the way you get there is not by memorizing a grammar book. It's by getting lots and lots of exposure and lots and lots of practice. It depends on the season, uh, depending on how busy I am with, with other projects and, and things, but uh, another Barry Farberism is trying to use what he calls hidden moments. So finding little scraps of time that are otherwise just thrown away that you would be staring off into space or, you know, staring into your device. You can use that time. And I try to do that just to get a little bit in no matter what every day, whether it's, you know, reading a foreign language article or a book or listening to a podcast or, or doing reps of, of flashcards, you know, waiting in line, you know, waiting for the phone to connect, uh, commuting, things like that. There's many, hopefully if I look back, there's more positives than negatives, but I think probably the lowest low was, uh, when I was working for the Japanese government and as part of my job, I did interpreting and translation. And there was one morning when I showed up and they said, okay, John, today we're going to a cancer research center 
and you're going to be interpreting for all of the English speakers who have come and visited the, the prefecture. And so we're at this cancer research center, there's somebody giving a PowerPoint presentation in Japanese, and there are words in English that I don't know, like concepts and words in this highly technical presentation. And here I am supposedly, you know, being the interpreter. And I, there, there was a lot of, of silence because I, <laughs> I did not know a lot of what was happening. Um, so that was a bit of a blow, but, um, I learned after the fact that, you know, in normal professional interpreting, you not only have time to prepare, you know, what's coming ahead. And so you can really, you know, beef up your vocabulary about that specific topic. But more importantly, usually interpreters specialize in one particular field because it's just too much to know everything on every single technical, uh, domain. So. I went to France a few summers ago to attend my older brother and his wife's uh, sort of they had like a wedding party. She's French Swiss. And I'd studied a little bit of French in high school, but it was basically gone. And so before that trip, I, I really tried to hit the French again. And I was pretty blown away with my ability to actually communicate with members of her family and friends. I, you know, the expectation I had was I'll be able to order food and get around without much trouble. But I actually had conversations and that was, that was really delightful. And they were, I think, pretty surprised too, that this, uh, you know, gringo could actually, you know, hold his own a little bit. Many, um, They've kind of changed over the years as I've changed sort of my philosophies about language learning. But when I first got into uh, linguistics, you know, people like Steven Pinker and Noam Chomsky, you know, they were sort of my heroes. And then as I got into more independent language learning, uh, they changed to people like, you know, Benny Lewis and Steve Kaufman and Ollie Richards. And um, and then since I went to the uh, polyglot gathering this last uh, June, you know, so many people there. I mean, you see their badges and they're just covered in the flags of all the languages they speak. And I'm here with my, you know, just a few flags. And I thought, wow, they're um, OK. Yeah, people like um, Richard Simcott, he do my new probably hero because he's I think he uses 14 languages professionally, like on a daily basis. And that's just amazing to me. Okay, number one thing would be spend your time in the language instead of spending your time in your native language learning about the language. So if English, for example, is your native language, don't spend all your time reading about, you know, Japanese, for example, in English. You should spend your time as much as possible in Japanese. 